Hey, 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 I'm in the studio. <laughs> hey, listen, everybody, thank you for joining me. I'm still here in the studio. I'm doing like a, a unload of all of this content that I have. I'm telling people I have content that can last like a year. And so there's so many pieces of um, footage that I capture in my travels. And so it's uh, a lot of this footage is just like good footage, uh, really good footage. So this right here, I want everybody who, everybody, anybody who's watching, whether you're a part of the African diaspora, or just people who are in, interested in having um, conversations that are probably not had a whole lot. But what I want you to understand is that with one of the journeys that you'll see many people who are in America battle is when it comes to going to Africa, they'll go all over the world. And I'm intentional about, you know, speaking Af about Africa um, uh, monolithically. And there are a couple of things that, that why, why, something just popped into my mind. Uh, we'll go to Asia, we'll go to Europe, we'll go to Australia, we'll go to South America, we'll go to the Caribbean, we'll go to Mexico, we'll go to anywhere else other than Africa. And that's because for most of us, it's based upon what we have been told. And so the question I often ask is, in the, in the previous talk, who told you? Who told you that Africans sold their brothers and sisters into slavery? Who told you that? Or are we now putting that in a modern context in our own mind and looking at so based upon skin color and based upon seeing it how we see it, we say that's our brother, our sister, uh, when in actuality, that might not that might not have been their context. That might not have been their narrative. But again, until someone points it out to us that times were different then, and that this whole uh, this whole idea of skin color, black and white, was something that somebody made up, and so much to the point where we even identify that particular way, which again, most of us didn't even consider. So uh, all of this, I, I think about, and I think about the angst that a lot of people have when it comes to going to different parts of Africa. The fear, I mean, I'm in tourism, I bring people on tours and you would be amazed at the level of fear and anxiety that they project based upon what they were told. And it's like those who are, they already know, well, there's nothing really to fear, nothing more to fear. I mean, as a matter of fact, you will talk to people who, countless people who say how much peace they have in different parts of Africa versus what they experience in America. But for someone whose mind has been told its own narrative and they're not willing to step outside of that or even for those who are willing to step outside of it they have to go through that transitional period i get it i've been there i know what i went through how terrified i was because of what people told me but here's what's interesting when i went to the continent of africa and and i encourage you to watch my previous talk on who told you to because because uh, i know sometimes i try not to belabor the point on a second video or follow-up video so please i exhausted it on the previous uh discussion but one of the things that fascinated me when i first went to africa in 2018 and now here 17 countries later uh dual citizenship in sierra leone been to the top of mount kilimanjaro taken uh by, by the time this year is over over 500 people to um, the content, different parts of Africa. What's, what always fascinated me is how the people who were in control of the narrative, meaning the curriculums, the history books, the systems, and all of that, I found that they were all over Africa and quite comfortable in Africa, whether it be Tanzania, Kenya, South Africa, Ghana, Egypt, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, wherever, Senegal, very, very comfortable. But the people who have considerable DNA that descends from there instinctively avoid it and gravitate towards European interests, quick to be in Paris, quick to be in Greece, quick to be in London, Lisbon, Madrid, Frankfurt, um, Amsterdam, I could go on and on and on and on, Brussels, but when it came to Africa, they would opt to go to Lagos, Portugal, instead of Lagos, Nigeria, based on what they were told. Hmm, a lot of people didn't know there was a Lagos, Portugal. 
and the Portuguese getting in there first. Anyway, that's that's a whole other histor- history lesson. But I want you to see some of the comfort others enjoy on the continent and then why it could be beneficial. Well, one, why it's beneficial for, for you to visit, but then why others might not want you to visit. So take a look. All right, this is at the Art Center in Accra, Ghana. And it looks like a group of um, gentlemen. I'm not sure if they're from Europe or America, or Australia, but very, very comfortable. Not an ounce of fear expressed. Learning the traditional lang- uh, drum, not language, but traditional drumming and all of that. see so many people coming from these different countries very comfortable because they know that the people in many parts of Africa have been I don't want to say domesticated but but docilated <laughs> I'm making up a word here uh, but as it, when it pertains to white people many people uh, in Africa actually see them as saviors actually see them as people come to rescue them actually put them on a pedestal instead of seeing them as equals and it's not that you go around hating someone of a different ethnicity but what you begin to see is where and this is you know i've seen this you know my accent will get me either overcharged or get me a favor because of how I speak the English language or because of how many black Americans have been perceived in a celebrity status based on television and and all of that. Um, But again, when you sit and you look at this and you say to yourself, wow, they're not afraid. As a matter of fact, many of them will vacation in all throughout the continent of Africa But those who descend from Africa, who are part of the African diaspora, have never even been. It's never even crossed their mind. It's not even a part of their plan. They get upset and they get hostile when you sit and and, and ask, hey, well, you know, if you consider going to Africa, I'm not going to Africa. I'm not going to Africa. I'm not going. I don't want to go. I'm not African. I'm not. I don't want to go to Africa. I don't want to go to Africa. You're not going to make me go to Africa. You're not going to shame me into going to Africa. What do you mean you're not going to shame me? You're not going to shame me into going to Africa. I don't want to go to Africa. I don't care to go to Africa. Don't want to go to Africa. Don't, 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 don't. Never going to Africa. You know, I mean, there are a lot of people who have that kind of energy and they probably don't need to go to Africa. But it's sad because they're going based on what someone told them. Nine times out of ten. I'm not saying everybody's experience is going to be perfection or whatever it is when they go to Africa. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying that 54 countries, thousands of ethnic groups, and you have to wonder to yourself, so many people who descend from there either don't want to descend from there, don't want any association, and why is that? Because that's where the wealth is. See, the thing is, when you take a raw material and you can take it, whether it's dirt, whether it's gold, copper, uranium, bauxite, tanzanite, cocoa, oil, diamonds, whatever. People, but let's just use the, the, the raw materials as an example. If you can take that and produce it, so you can get it dirt cheap, literally. Take it out of the country, mass produce it, sell it back to the people that it came from, (coughs) if you can do that, that's brilliant because you get pennies on a dollar or or whatever, pennies on the CD, pennies on the shilling, pennies on the uh, rand, whatever. You take that and you can sell it around the world. You can do whatever you want to do with it. That's the wealth. You don't want people knowing about that. 
So what you do is you take a group of people away to, oh, that's bad. Don't go. You do it subliminally through culture and entertainment and through social pressures and all of that. You control the education. The people don't even question it. They go with it. They say, oh, no, no, no. I was told. I read in the book. So-and-so said. This person said. And then if you, especially if you put um, European and white standards as a superior standards, then the people will say, yeah, well, no, you know, I don't need to go over there. They're witchcraft. So, so that's the first thing you do. Get the religion in there, demonizing the people. So you're like, oh, no, you're the devil. Stay away. Oh, God. Oh, stay away. You're the devil. Now, I'm not saying that some things don't, don't happen, but the same things happen in America. If there's going to be a negative aspect of witchcraft or whatever you want to call it, uh, then that's going to be all over the world. It's not just going to be in Africa. You know, you got Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, welcome everyone. Getting value from agricultural produce is a very lucrative business that many do not know. The few who know are making millions in dollars. Enter the Nigerian company that just launched production and it is led by a woman. As they say, whatever a man can do, a woman can do better. Her company is one of many that took advantage of the CBN import prohibition list. All products on the list are prohibited from getting foreign exchange from the official channels. People who want to import these items must buy Forex from the black market, which you know the exchange rate is going haywire recently. That's if you can find dollars in the first place. Many people are setting up local manufacturing of the prohibited items so they can fill the void and of course make some money for themselves. That's exactly what Yemisi did. She first set up a cassava processing plant where they extract the starch from the cassava. That was before the starch was added to the import prohibition list. Sales wasn't as good because of imports but immediately starch was banned, boom! Many multinationals turned to her company to fill up their supplies and production quickly reached 40 tons per day. Not only that, they have sold more than $20 million worth of starch to the Nigerian breweries, Nestle, Unilever and many other multinationals. Before the CBN import prohibition, these companies were importing starch worth more than $7 million per annum. After the success in starch production, the company have taken another bold step and expanded into another byproduct of cassava, which Nigeria also imports. But because there are no cassava to sorbitol processing plants in Nigeria and even Africa, she had to design one with her team. In fact, she ended up building the second largest cassava to sorbitol processing plant in the world. The first one is in Indonesia. According to her, she faced challenges at the onset and she had to assemble a team of brilliant young Nigerians. They brainstormed day and night until they came up with the design of the processing plant. The cassava-based sorbitol plant is 100% their intellectual property. It was designed and built from scratch to completion by Nigerians. All their efforts have now paid off as Sultry International is now filling the gap and supplying cassava-based sorbitol to the Nigerian market. Sorbitol is a naturally occurring sweetener that is used in making toothpaste, oral hygiene products and also in the pharmaceutical industry. 
The cassava processing plant is expected to provide more than 10,000 direct and indirect jobs in the surrounding communities where the plant is located in Oyo State. Farmers within the 200-kilometer radius of the factory can supply them cassava and get paid instantly. This is brilliant. There is nothing more satisfying than having a ready market that can buy all you have as fast as you can produce them. This will motivate farmers in the area to acquire more lands and expand their farms because they know that immediately after harvesting the cassava, they are already swimming in money. This brings us to the big one, the largest cassava-based ethanol plant in Makode, Benue State. Before we see that, make sure to subscribe to our channel now and enable notification. You can also join our channel membership to donate and support our work. Thanks for your support. I will, in terms of, I will go into more details about uh, my suggestions about locations and so on. And, and um, there are African countries that are uh, good examples of Pan-Africanism. I will just mention a, a few like um, Namibia. <laughs> Recently, I, I, I saw a thing about Namibia and I was so pleasantly surprised to see that Namibia, they fly both the, the uh, AU or OAU flag and the Namibia flag. Also, the, U, the anthems of both countries are played at, at, at major events. Uh, sometime uh, at the start of the event, usually the, the OAU anthem or AU anthem is played, then the Namibia and then uh, and Namibian anthem, and then at the end of the 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 event, it, they would do it the other way around. Namibia first, and the OAU anthem after that. So, in countries like Namibia and Rwanda and Ghana, just to uh, to mention a few, with leaders who are setting the example for Pan African cooperation. And um, there, it, it's increasing. It's uh, it's more countries, more leaders, more people, and uh, it's it's getting better and better over time. So I'm asking for your help in spreading the word. Uh, please make your comments in uh, in the comment section of of this video. And in future episodes, I am going to make for more suggestions and would love your comments also. And uh, we, have to, we have to remember that the... Um, I, I, I forgot to mention, I wanted to mention recent, the recent meeting, the cooperation and... Uh, people working together, like um, the recent meeting between Brother Akon and Dr. Arikana. It's a wonder Brother Akon is doing so much good work in Africa. And it's a good example of cooperation. Also at that meeting was uh, Brother Jesse Holland, writer of the Wakanda novel, and he was involved in the Wakanda One movie. Uh, again, recently I saw Woody Meyer interview Dr. Arikana. And there are other people and other organizations like the um, US Black Chamber of Commerce that we, we need to, to work together, cooperate, work together. Uh, the US Black Chamber of Commerce and the US um, legal uh, association that participated was well represented and participated in the 
launching of the Wakanda One project in Ghana uh, by the ADDI at the end of end of last year. So um, I, uh, I just want to say we need the, to grow, to increase, to continue our to get uh, our struggle for a black economic. We need the black economic power movement. Uh, reparations now for slavery and colonialism to plant and grow black businesses, not for consumption. Africa for the Africans at home and abroad. United we stand, but divided we fall. Okay, uh, thank you and please uh, sub subscribe, comment and subscribe to this channel and and uh, take care until next time cooling on a couch watching tv no i'm feeling nothing but lazy feeling to some nothing else to do but as walk to the board and drop some brand new living on a dice throwing shit down making me vibe to the sound but to stop hungry then i'm up for the clock now I found out you like it in this Where are you Where are your papers? As long as I produce one common passport of Africa, it's a passage. Let me go. And anyone, free movements of persons and goods, anyone who brings the Chinese goods here, and claim their Malawian goods, there should be heavy fines, including imprisonment for such people. It must be purely Malawian goods which are produced in Malawi, which are going to a free movement in the whole of African continent. In that way, we're growing, we're going to grow each other. There is no Malawian who's going to come here. There is no Zimbabwean who's going to come here. They will stay in their countries because there are opportunities there for their countries who are trading with each other without any restrictions. The Europeans, through the European Union, they are doing it. But they can't allow us to do it. I, I, I'm, I'm more insulted by Africans than anyone else when I say, let's have a borderless continent, let's have free movement of persons and goods. South Africans have been made to believe that there is nothing outside South Africa. And we've got a lot of things to offer to the continent. But the way we are so restricted, we don't think that there is a world outside South Africa. And we even think there is Africa, then there is South Africa. So that's where our problem is. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, dear friends and fellow Africans. When we are talking about borderless continent, uh, maybe some of our people, they didn't understand what we mean. For instance, this is our final product. I remember almost three months ago, uh, we started this project of making sure that we can feed ourselves. We cannot continue to depend on others. So we have our product here. So we need this product to be, to be used in another country or around the continent of, of, of Africa. Because we, have, we, are, we don't have this what you call borderless continent. We have borders, they're so divided, so that this food cannot move from one country or from my place here to Nigeria or to uh, Burkina Faso because of these barriers. That's why we are talking about uh, uh, free movement of goods and uh, people. So we insist, we Africans, you know, sometimes the people are talking about Africa, we have a shortage of food. Yeah, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Because there are some places where there is a lot of and a huge uh, amount of food. But because we are not uh, integrated, we have no free movement of people and goods. That's why uh, these food that are found here cannot move to another place. So the people who are, who are talking about the shortage of food in Africa, they are maintaining, they are maintaining those status to make sure that they can continue feeding Africa because they are making a lot of money through transport. They create employment for their people, uh, the people who are producing those grains and the other kind of food. 
But we Africa, we have our own food. Why can't we allow free movement of goods and people so that the food from here can move around the continent and the food from Kenya can move to Uganda, the same to bananas from Uganda can move to Tanzania, something like that. The cocoa from Ghana can move to Ethiopia. That's what we, we, we want to talk about. We need to have this free movement of goods and people so that we can feed the entire continent. We can... Uh, we can do business among ourselves. So we have maintained this status of saying that Africa, we have a shortage of food. Africa, we don't have maybe uh, enough food. We have malnutrition. Of course, yes, but for myself, I, I think there is a propaganda that has, uh, that has uh, uh, created to make sure that Africa, we cannot integrate you cannot allow free movement so that the people can make a lot of money through africa and we know that uh this uh shortage of food made uh, make and made some western uh, countries very rich because they supply food to us sometimes they give us loan so that we can buy food but sometimes we don't need loan we we have our own food here like this and every country in africa i'm sure there has big rivers there is uh, enough water where we can do irrigation we can do of course we also we have rain seasons so we can feed ourselves there's no need for us africans to depend on other countries for food but because we have maintaining these borders that's why the food from one place to another is very difficult so we we continue to 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 to, to depend on the others and by maintaining these borders that's why we are talking about the borderless continent we, we don't need to have borders among ourselves we are africans we are one so let us remove these borders allow goods and food to move free from one place to another so that africa can become uh, independent in terms of food and other things and the other stuffs so that was my opinion for today thank you for watching Remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and share it with your contacts. Thank you.